Good morning, everyone, and welcome, at least virtually, to Marquette University Law School. My name is David Strifling, and it is an honor for me as director of our Water Law and Policy Initiative, and on behalf of our Dean, Joseph Kearney, to welcome you to today's event held in partnership with Current's Chicago Water Week. Besides welcoming you, my purpose is to give just a bit of context for this conference. Over the past decade or so, Marquette Law School has engaged in exploring the current state and the future of the Chicago megacity. This is the 21 county region beginning in the northern Milwaukee suburbs, encompassing six counties in southeastern Wisconsin and stretching southward into Illinois, where it sweeps in 10 counties, including, of course, Chicago and Cook County. And it extends into Indiana, that state's five northwesternmost counties. In 2012, together with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, we hosted our first conference on the topic focused on Milwaukee's future in the Chicago megacity. Three years later, in 2015, we hosted our second megacity conference directed toward examining public attitudes in the region. The key interest then, which we pursued through the Marquette Law School poll, was to advance our understanding of how citizens in the region view opportunities and challenges on a personal and regional basis on issues ranging from transportation to tourism. And three years after that, in 2018, we made our first foray into the water-related issues tied to the megacity's future, including the use of water as a tool for economic development, the challenge of delivering a safe and healthy water supply, and the role of the Great Lakes Compact. We have investigated a variety of megacity-related issues in the intervening years, but Chicago Water Week provided a perfect opportunity for us to revisit the megacity in a big way with another major water conference. Our focus on water policy in the megacity is in keeping with a parallel set of developments also occurring over the past decade or so. In 2009, Marquette Law School launched a water law program with a series of courses intended to support the Milwaukee region's broader efforts to become a national and worldwide leader in water research and policy. This goal has been well supported by our university leadership. And you see on uh, the screen now a slide showing the law school and our campus more broadly. Marquette President Mike Lovell has, since his arrival here in 2014, recognized the importance of this work and has exhorted all of our academic units to become leaders in solving the world's water problems. Here at the law school, our efforts have expanded to include public education programs, presentations, media appearances, white papers, and grant supported work leading to academic publications. One highlight was our September 2016 conference titled Public Policy in American Drinking Water, which Milwaukee Mayor Barrett has called the source of an epiphany for him and that spurred the city to significant reforms in how it attacked the issue of lead laterals. We've done all this in ongoing collaboration with partners inside and outside the university, including, uh, to name just a few, the City of Milwaukee, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, the Water Council, the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences, and of course, researchers in other disciplines here at Marquette. Today, we're happy to add current to this list of partners. So this conference reunites those two initiatives, that is both our exploration of the Chicago megacity and the law school's water law and policy initiative. The nexus is obvious. As we discussed at the 2018 conference, Lake Michigan constitutes the defining geographic feature of the Chicago megacity. Today, we will extend the conversation about water policy in the megacity in new directions. We will explore first the past, the history of the internationally acclaimed Chicago lakefront with a focus on the effect of the American public trust doctrine and a comparison to corresponding developments presented in Milwaukee. Second, the present, the megacity region's water infrastructure crisis, its effects on our most vulnerable communities and the infrastructure bills pending in Congress. And third, the future, the megacity region's readiness for the damage that climate change is expected to inflict on the Great Lakes region, 
and the prediction that the climate crisis will cause mass migration toward the relatively cooler temperatures and abundant freshwater supply in the upper Midwest. So that's how we arrived at the theme for this conference, water policy in the Chicago megacity, past, present, and future. To get us going, we will begin with the co-authors of the remarkable and very well-received new book, Lakefront, Public Trust and Private Rights in Chicago. They are Joseph Kearney, Dean and Professor of Law here at the Law School, and Thomas Merrill, Charles Evans Hughes Professor at Columbia Law School. Dean Kearney and Professor Merrill will be our guides for a tour of how the, the splendid Chicago lakefront came to be and the lessons it may hold for Milwaukee and for urban development more generally. We'll have a short break after their discussion. So again, welcome, and let me turn it over to Dean Kearney. Good morning, and thank you, Dave. This is a bit of a role reversal. I'm accustomed to being at our conferences in more of an introductory role than a substantive one. I certainly appreciate all the work that you do as director of our water law and policy initiative. And I also am glad for the opportunity today to be a presenter. We wish all of you were here with us in Eckstein Hall, but we're going to spend most of our time on the lakefront anyway. I do feel largely well prepared for the moment. After all, my co-author, Tom Merrill, and I spent portions of more than 20 years working on Lakefront, our new book about Chicago. And as Dave has noted, Tom is here in Milwaukee with us today and will be part of this presentation. K may come before M in the alphabet, but it is Tom Merrill who long before Lakefront had established an international reputation as a scholar of property law, among other fields. I used the word largely, though, because we're going to go somewhat beyond Lakefront and Chicago and Illinois to include some comments about Milwaukee and Wisconsin. These comments do not stand on equally lengthy research, but we have had a bit of help. In addition, to Professor Striffling's guidance for us about Wisconsin law in this sphere. We have the benefit of John Goethe's wonderful book of a couple of years ago, Milwaukee, City Built on Water. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to get a copy. Maybe you will be able to swing a package deal and get lakefront at the same time. In accepting this invitation, Tom and I considered the precise angle from which we might look at Lake Michigan. One could consider the occasional rivalry or at any rate disputes that parts of the megacity region have had with one another with respect to the lake. In particular, some of you may be familiar with the struggles between Illinois and Wisconsin over pollution in the lake. That has involved federal law of one sort or another at different times, as in some early 1970s litigation in the US Supreme Court. We decided that instead, for now, consistently with our book, we would focus on the public trust doctrine, or doctrines, perhaps we should say, as we will explain. Even before we get there and sketch out some parallels between the Illinois and Wisconsin versions of the public trust doctrine, we think it worthwhile to note some parallels between the lakefronts of Chicago and Milwaukee. We note some of the geographic parallels on this slide, including the general orientation of both cities to Lake Michigan, and their location on the Great Lakes waterway more generally. The phenomenon of multiple rivers or river branches converging into a single outlet in the lake. And some of the 19th century engineering work that had to be done in each city 
to make a harbor out of the junction between the river and the lake, including both the dredging of the river's mouth and construction of a lake breakwater. We found the parallels to be rather striking. The parallels continue in other aspects of each city's water development, whether this has involved 19th century sewage problems or the solution in a system of sewers entering into the river designed by the same 19th century engineer, Ellis Chesbro, and thus the entry of the sewage into the lake and the water supply, or the consequent construction of water intakes farther into the lake and eventually of deep tunnel projects. And there are also lakefront related parallels, quite striking ones. The original urban lakefront in both Chicago and Milwaukee developed with the railroads. The modern lakefront in both cities is more about parks and pleasure drives than commerce. Just to linger for a moment on the former point, here are in fact photos of Illinois Central's Central Station in Chicago along 12th Street, demolished in 1974, and the Chicago and Northwestern's Lakefront Depot in Milwaukee, which met the same fate a few years earlier in 1968. We are going to spend most of our time in Chicago, where our expertise lies, because our book, Lakefront, Public Trust and Private Rights in Chicago, covers the waterfront, I can't help but saying. You can get a sense of that from this map, which is one of the original maps that we had created for Lakefront in order to help guide the reader, especially those who are not from the city. You will see that our story goes all the way down from Northwestern University in Evanston, the top of the map, of course, to the Calumet River on the far south side. To be sure, the book is organized not geographically, but in a combination of chronologically and doctrinally, as we say in the law. And as mentioned, we are going to concentrate today on probably the most important legal theme, the public trust doctrine, which has undergone considerable change over the more than 125 years it has been applied on the Chicago lakefront. We do need some background first. It especially involves the current in Lake Michigan, which circulates near the downtown Chicago lakefront in a counterclockwise fashion. So the Chicago River, many of you can picture it today, depicted here in about 1830, came to be blocked by a sandbar at its mouth. The US Army engineers soon devised a solution, not shown here, by building piers on the north and south sides of the river as it entered the lake, eliminating the curve that you do see here and straightening out the river's discharge into the lake. This functioned like a spout and worked to keep the river open to water traffic. South of the river, the effect of the current was erosion. This was along a narrow strip of land called Lake Park. Today, it's the west side of Grant Park. The erosion was so bad that it almost caused Michigan Avenue to collapse into the lake. The solution, everyone agreed, was to build a breakwater offshore, but the residents and politicians of Chicago did not agree on how to pay for such a breakwater. The solution, oddly enough, was a railroad. In 1852, the brand new Illinois Central Railroad, or IC, was being built up from the southern part of the state and needed to enter the city of Chicago. A deal was cut that enabled the railroad to come in along the lakefront, provided that it would build and maintain a breakwater to protect the shore. 
The result, this is not shown on this particular map, was that the Illinois Central entered the city at 22nd Street along the shore of Lake Michigan. Then at 12th Street going north, the tracks were built on trestles in the lake up until Randolph Street. The trestles and the lake shore were both protected by the breakwater that the IC also built just to the east of the track. In the 1860s then, the lakefront looked as you see it in this photograph. Michigan Avenue is on the left. We're looking north here. Then you see the thin strip of land called Lake Park to its right. Then there is a shallow lagoon with small boats. Then you can see the tracks of the Illinois Central on trestles. And then you can barely make out the breakwater east of the tracks to the far right. In the distance to the north and slightly east, you see the IC's depot and terminal facilities north of Randolph sitting on landfill. The Prudential building pretty much occupies the site of the original terminal itself. After the Civil War, Chicago kept growing and the existing harbor, the Chicago River, became incredibly congested. There was a general consensus that the region needed to build a new harbor on wharfs in the lake. In 1867, a number of entrepreneurs in Chicago lobbied the state legislature in Springfield for a grant of the bed of the lake to build such a harbor. You can well imagine the alarm within the corporate offices of the Illinois Central, both in Chicago and in New York. Such a grant to construct a harbor would get in the railroad's way in any number of respects. So the IC launched a campaign to secure a grant of the lake bed for itself with clever lobbying and at least a little graft, it would seem. It won over the downstate legislators and others outside the Chicago region. An 1869 statute called the Lakefront Act gave the IC the approximately 1,000 acres of submerged land due east of downtown Chicago to construct an outer harbor. Chicagoans were most displeased. The 1869 Act was dubbed locally the Lakefront Steel. And in 1873, a new legislature in the midst of the Granger movement repealed it. The repeal further confused the picture regarding who could build an outer harbor. The IC claimed that the repeal was unconstitutional on the theory that the original grant in 1869 had given it a vested right. It stubbornly refused to compromise with the city or the Michigan Avenue property owners who wanted to get rid of the railroad on the lakefront altogether. The multi-sided conflict explains why the World's Fair of 1893, the Columbian Exposition, ended up in Jackson Park rather than in the city center in what is now called Grant Park. The fair's location and activities in Jackson Park are themselves quite famous, but how it came to be there and not on the downtown lakefront as originally planned is among the significant historical events recounted in the book that it's just a fact to say no one had ever really previously researched or documented. In any event, the result was not so bad for the railroad since in a six month period in 1893, it transported a staggering 8.7 million passengers between downtown and the fair at 10 cents a trip. Here you see some passengers preparing to embark for the fair, not by railroad, but by a steamer from near downtown at Van Buren Street. Litigation over the Lakefront Act finally reached the Supreme Court of the United States in 
1892 in a momentous decision for Chicago and for American law more generally, Justice Stephen Field, writing for a most narrow majority, upheld the repeal. The theory was novel. It's not so much that he held the state to have title to the bed of Lake Michigan, although he did. It's more that he also said that it was, quote, a title different in character from that which the state holds in lands intended for sale. Rather, it was a title, quoting again, held in trust for the people of the state so that they may enjoy the navigation of the waters, carry on commerce over them, and have liberty of fishing therein, freed from the obstruction or interference of private parties. So it was that the Lakefront case announced what has come to be called the Public Trust Doctrine. Let me make three things about it clear. First, there was no suggestion at the time that the trust extended beyond navigable waters and the submerged land beneath them, or that the trust was designed to advance environmental or preservationist goals. It was all about navigation, fishing, and commerce on the water. Second, the court did not specify who the trustee was. Was it the state legislature or was it the courts? And if the state legislature, how much deference, if any, should the courts give to the legislature's determination that a particular conveyance of submerged land was in the public interest? Third, in 1894, in a separate case from Oregon, the Supreme Court clarified that the newly announced public trust doctrine was a matter of state law. So there could and would be variation. Let's move the story forward. The identity of the trustee was provided by the Illinois Supreme Court in a decision rendered only four years after the Lakefront case. This 1896 decision, the Kirk case, arose out of a scheme by wealthy property owners to seize control of the contested lakefront land immediately north of the Chicago River, now known as Streeterville. On this side of the river, the effect of the lake's current was not erosion, but accretion. The original lakefront property owner's most notorious rival for the new land was Captain George Wellington Streeter, shown here with his fourth wife, Ma. There were substantial and fascinating gambits by others, including the Potawatomi Indian tribe. You can find all of that in Lakefront. The successful scheme, the one concocted by the wealthy landowners, explains why Lakeshore Drive, coming south from Lincoln Park, turns sharply at Oak Street toward the lake and heads east for some distance before it turns south again. The idea was that the Lincoln Park District would obtain the permission of the legislature to extend Lakeshore Drive in this way out and around the contested area as you went south. The Park District would then transfer the new land between the drive and the existing shore to the west to the wealthy owners. In exchange, they would pay for the cost of constructing this new portion of the drive along the lake at the eastern edge of the new land. The public rationale for the scheme to extend Lakeshore Drive was so that it might serve as a pleasure drive to the south of Lincoln Park. But this was quite evidently a pretext the original segment of the drive in Lincoln Park to the north, you see it here on the left, clearly did serve such a purpose. But Streeterville was hardly an inviting place for a Sunday buggy ride. You can see that in the photo on the right, even though it's a photo of the area almost a decade after the drive was extended there. There's also the fact that the road would dead end going south around Ohio Street. There was opposition to the Streeterville expansion. 
particularly from the emerging progressive movement, the state attorney general tried to block the project under the public trust theory announced in the 1892 Lakefront case. The Illinois Supreme Court, though, ruled against him, favoring the Park District and its allies, the wealthy landowners. In the Kirk case, the court held that the legislature, as the people's elected representative, was the trustee of the public trust, and the court should defer, courts generally should defer to its judgments. The Kirk ruling was quite significant. Let's go back briefly to our general map. For the next 75 years, the only impediment from the public trust doctrine to landfilling of Lake Michigan along the Chicago shore was the need to get the legislature to grant the submerged land. This was not nothing as requirements go, but the legislature was weak and easily swayed during most of this period. At the same time, the lakefront case made it impossible to grant a large enough amount of land to a private corporation to build an outer harbor. If a new harbor was to be built, it would have to be a public one. But the city and state politicians could not agree on where to put it or how to pay for it. The only portion of a public harbor that was ever built anywhere near downtown is what's now called Navy Pier. Commercial lake traffic would go to the Calumet River on the far south side. So in fact, lots of landfilling occurred in this seven and a half decades after Kirk, but mostly by various park districts. Inspired by Daniel Burnham's plan of Chicago, one result was Grant Park in the middle along the lakefront. To the north, Lincoln Park, including the northern extension of Lakeshore Drive, was built as far as Hollywood Avenue, stopping there for reasons that we unearth in Lakefront. On the other side of town, the South Park Commission built a drive and a more modest park, Burnham Park, connecting Grant and Jackson Parks. Let's pause for the briefest of moments, we're a little more than halfway through at this point, to note that there is a lot else in the book about which we'd like to tell you besides the public trust doctrine. In particular here, we must largely omit the story of the prolonged struggle over the construction of public buildings in what we now know as Grant Park. There is an aspect of the story though, important to relate. So let me do that briefly. Aaron Montgomery Ward, the great catalog store merchant and some other Michigan avenues, both before him and after him, succeeded in keeping Grant Park free of monumental buildings other than the Art Institute. Their success was not based on the public trust doctrine. Rather, it was premised on a distinct property law doctrine, somewhat confusingly because of the similar sound known as the public dedication doctrine. Ward was able to show that early plants of the area around Lake Park were qualified by the notation that the park was forever to remain vacant of buildings. As a result of Ward's efforts, the Field Museum and other public structures had to be located south of 12th Street. Here we see in 1921, the newly constructed and then quite lonely Field Museum on landfill just south of Grand Park. This too is in the book in considerable detail but I'll simply note that notwithstanding the name, the public dedication doctrine, Ward and others were invoking a right that at least on the Chicago lakefront has been especially associated with owners of private property adjoining public land. 
So let's continue with the public trust doctrine in its modern birthplace of Chicago. The state of the doctrine by the early 1960s can be seen by considering Northwestern University's major project to expand its campus in Evanston by landfilling in the lake. Here we see the original Northwestern campus. In the early 1960s, the university got local, state, and federal approval for lakeward expansion, and the project sailed through. No one alleged that the project violated the public trust doctrine by replacing a large swath of navigable water with new land, and no litigation ensued. Here's the campus as it appeared in the early 1970s, shortly after the landfill expansion, and as it still largely does today. Things would change, and this is probably as good a time as any to hand things over to Tom Merrill so that he can handle the hard stuff. If we have time at the end, and if anyone has typed in questions via the Q&A function, we will be glad to take those up. So over to my wonderful co-author. Uh, thanks very much, Joe, and welcome to everyone participating in the conference. Um, uh, as Joe has recounted, the uh, public trust doctrine in Illinois uh, kind of reached a point of uh, uh, desuetude, you might say, uh, by the mid-1960s. Uh, all you really needed to do was get the uh, legislature to grant you some land under Lake Michigan and perhaps get the Army Corps of Engineers to say it wouldn't interfere with public navigation. Things changed uh, dramatically, at least as a matter of um, uh, written law in 1970 with a uh, decision called uh, PEPKE. Um, the, uh, I think we have a slide that shows uh, the nature of the controversy. It, was, it didn't involve the lakefront per se. It involved a, a proposal to take a chunk of Washington Park, which had never been uh, part of navigable waters or submerged land under the navigable waters, and transfer it uh, for the construction of a new schoolhouse. Uh, the reason for the transfer, uh, the change in the public trust doctrine is, uh, the basic reason is relatively easy to pinpoint. Uh, the environmental movement had gotten going by 1970, particularly in Chicago's South Side. So uh, the Pepe decision uh, uh, was authored by a, a justice of the Illinois Supreme Court who served for only a short period of time on a temporary kind of basis, and who happened to be a strong advocate of public parks. Uh, he did uh, three things to the doctrine, uh, which were of considerable significance. First of all, uh, he adopted the principle that any taxpayer in Illinois has standing uh, to bring a public trust challenge, to challenge the transfer of public trust lands uh, to a private citizen. Um, secondly, um, Justice Burt uh, increased uh, the nature of the interests protected by the public trust doctrine. It was no longer limited to commerce, navigation, and fishing, but rather uh, uh, it also included recreational, environmental, and preservationist goals. And in this fashion, uh, Justice Burt relied heavily on a recent law review article by University of Michigan professor Joseph Sachs, uh, whose article was uh, highly influential in the development of the public trust doctrine uh, overall. Uh, thirdly, uh, Justice Burt, uh, uh, at least implicitly, uh, suggested that the public trust doctrine would apply to an inland park having no connection uh, to the Navajo waters. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Pepke decision uh, was another defeat for, uh, or was a defeat for the environmentalists. Uh, uh, the votes weren't there to invalidate the transfer of the park to the school district. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Illinois unanimously upheld the change in use of these lands. Uh, but the doctrinal change uh, reflected in the Pepke decision uh, soon uh, had uh, greater consequences. Um, the controversy uh, involved the uh, South Works, they were called, of the United States Steel Company, which were built on the far south side of Chicago, uh, near the uh, adjacent to the Calumet River. Um, and here we see a picture of the Southworks in their heyday at the time of the controversy that I'm about to describe. Um, in uh, 1963, I believe it was, the uh, uh, 
United States Steel went to the Illinois legislature and got uh, permission to expand its uh, footprint for the plant uh, by adding a significant number of acres, 173, I believe it was, um, uh, into the 195, excuse me, into the lake to the east. Uh, for reasons that are unclear, uh, the company never got around to actually tendering the money uh, to receive title to this submerged land until 1973. And by that time, uh, the environmental movement was uh, roaring forward and politicians of various stripes were anxious to uh, seize the mantle of the environmental advocate, uh, including William Scott, the Attorney General of Illinois, a Republican, but who uh, wanted to uh, obtain uh, the support of uh, suburban environmentalists and, and people otherwise concerned with uh, increasing um, uh, protection of the environment. So he brought suit under the public trust doctrine and claimed that this uh, filling of 195 acres violated the public trust doctrine. Uh, and the Illinois Supreme Court agreed, uh, citing uh, Pepke and relying on the new doctrine set forth in the Pepke case. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court uh, said that it could discern only a private purpose uh, for this grant of submerged land. Uh, of course, the justification that the legislature had adopted was that it was going to help preserve, uh, at that time, uh, 10,000 uh, union jobs on the far south side of Chicago would provide additional tax revenues and so forth. Uh, but the Illinois Supreme Court said these sorts of pecuniary interests were not sufficient to justify a tra transfer of public trust lands to a private corporation. Uh, the upshot was that uh, the Illinois Steel Company had to rely on its existing footprint uh, and for various reasons, uh, probably mostly due to the general decline of the steel industry, not the decision of the uh, Supreme Court to refuse to allow them to fill additional land. Uh, the uh, company uh, closed its doors uh, in, and tried to sell off the plant, failed to find a buyer, eventually uh, uh, leveled the site, sold all the steel uh, facilities for scrap, and for the next 35 years uh, has failed to find anybody who is willing to acquire this land for any type of mixed-use uh, development, despite numerous uh, efforts to do so. Um, the public trust doctrine has never appeared in any of these uh, failed attempts, but one can't help but wonder if uh, lawyers advising uh, the potential purchasers are aware of the fact that this is public trust land and that the Illinois Supreme Court once held that it could not be transferred for private use. Another controversy that was quite interesting involved Loyola University in Chicago in the Rogers Park neighborhood on the far north side. Uh, Rogers Park faced problems similar to Northwestern in terms of being kind of landlocked uh, and being uh, uh, unable to expand the campus on uh, north, south, or west sides. And so Loyola came up with a project somewhat analogous to Northwestern's that it would like to fill in the lake uh, by adding 8.5 uh, acres of filled land for a campus expansion. Uh, following the script set forth by Northwestern, Loyola uh, did a uh, thorough job of touching base with all the relevant political actors, uh, got uh, the permission of both the U.S. and the Illinois EPA, got the permission of the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, their extensive environmental hearings under the National Environmental Policy Act. But uh, an advocacy group uh, called the Lake Michigan Federation uh, filed a lawsuit, this time in federal court, under a sort of questionable jurisdictional doctrine, um, perhaps. Uh, uh, in which the, uh, uh, the, the environmental group claimed that this violated the public trust doctrine. The federal district judge reading Pepke and reading the Steel uh, South Shore uh, case concluded that uh, Illinois, uh, Illinois' version of the public trust doctrine strictly prohibited uh, any transfer of the submerged lands of Lake Michigan for what could be described as a private purpose. And so uh, the judge uh, enjoined uh, uh, Loyola from engaging in its campus uh, expansion. Uh, uh, the university decided not to appeal, uh, probably because it had exhausted all of its available funds on hiring environmental consultants and lawyers. Uh, uh, let's move now to uh, the most recent uh, controversies involving the public trust doctrine. Um, the, uh, uh, you may have read about these or heard about these. Uh, they both uh, took place in federal court, like the uh, Loyola case, um, uh, but they reached uh, rather different outcomes. Uh, 
The first was a proposal by George Lucas, the famous movie director and promoter, uh, to build what was called a Museum of the Narrative Arts uh, on, on the Chicago lakefront uh, between Soldier Field and the McCormick Convention Center. Um, uh, Lucas created a private foundation which was going to pay for all the construction costs, was going to pay for all the operating costs, um, and uh, the museum would host, among other things, uh, props from his Star Wars movies. Uh, uh, the city political elite was quite enthusiastic about this idea. It uh, could see additional employment opportunities for Southsiders. It could see additional uh, tourist uh, attractions, uh, revenues from tourists visiting the city. Uh, and so the city uh, pushed it through the state legislature, uh, pushed it through all the city planning and zoning authorities, and got all the approvals, negotiated a lease, a uh, 99-year-plus lease with the Lucas Foundation. And then uh, uh, an advocacy group, uh, Friends of the Parks, uh, uh, like the, North, uh, the Lake Michigan Federation in the Loyola case, uh, invoking the universal standing uh, principle of the Pepke case, filed a lawsuit uh, challenging this under the Illinois Public Trust Doctrine. Uh, the district judge in the case, uh, 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 who's now deceased, uh, 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 looked favorably upon the claim. He, he, he held that he had jurisdiction over it. Uh, he held that uh, the Illinois legislature's approval was not adequate. Uh, he uh, suggested that there was going to be lengthy discovery and other types of proceedings before the issue was finally resolved. Uh, George Lucas got fed up. Uh, if Chicago didn't really want his museum, he would take it elsewhere. And so he's now building his museum uh, in Los Angeles. The most recent controversy involves the Obama Presidential Center. Uh, the biggest uh, issue about the uh, Chicago won the competition to be the site of uh, America's first African American president's presidential, what used to be called library. This one really doesn't have any books, it's mostly a digital. Uh, a display and museum. But anyway, um, uh, the, the big issue was where this was going to be located. So one possibility was west of Washington Park, the same place where the Pepke case was decided, or else uh, taking a slice out of Jackson Park, which was the site of the um, World's Fair in 1893. Uh, the foundation very much wanted Jackson Park. Uh, the city very much wanted to uh, make sure that the Obama Presidential Center uh, got what it wanted, and so uh, the decision was taken, made to locate it in uh, Jackson Park. Um, things seem to be rolling along. Here's a here's a depiction of what the uh, uh, OPC uh, is going to look like uh, as contemplated. Uh, things are rolling along until, uh, and the Friends of the Parks decided, uh, they, they didn't like this uh, location, but they decided not to sue. But a new advocacy group called uh, Protect Our Parks popped up. Uh, again, invoking universal citizen standing, uh, they filed suit again in federal court. Uh, this time, a different federal judge uh, heard the case, uh, proceeded much more expeditiously than in the Lucas case, uh, and uh, held that this did not violate the public trust doctrine because it was located on land that was never submerged. It was on solid land, and so uh, it was unclear that much of any scrutiny under Illinois law is appropriate uh, for land that was never submerged. Uh, this case went to the Seventh Circuit, uh, and an opinion by uh, Justice Judge, then Judge Amy Coney Barrett, in her last major decision before she joined the Supreme Court, uh, uh, held essentially that the plaintiffs didn't have any f standing for federal court purposes. They may have had universal standing for state purposes. Uh, and in any event, uh, the court had no jurisdiction over this claim. Uh, uh, so. Uh, that you might have thought would have been the end of the controversy of the, over the Obama Presidential Center, but the plaintiffs went back again, arguing that the permits granted by the federal government were inadequate. Uh, that was rejected again, and uh, the rejection was upheld by the Seventh Circuit. The Supreme Court declined to uh, take the case further, uh, uh, further, uh, uh, you know, uh, agitation, uh, uh, litigation has taken place, but. Uh, injunctions were denied, and so now uh, the land between Cornell and Stony Island is being bulldozed uh, as a site for the Obama Presidential Center. Uh, quickly turning to Wisconsin, as Joe noted, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court in 1894 basically said the public trust doctrine is a matter of state law, not federal law. So unsurprisingly, you get some interesting variations in the public trust doctrine uh, between uh, states, even those as closely connected as uh, Illinois and Wisconsin. 
Um, uh, in Illinois, uh, as Joe recounted, uh, the public trust doctrine is based on a sort of uh, a qualification of the title uh, that the state holds to a submerged land under Lake Michigan. Uh, and that qualification, although nobody knew it at the time, uh, existed since 1918, 1818, excuse me, when Illinois became a state. Uh, this results in a rather odd situation in Illinois because the Illinois courts had previously held that the land under navigable rivers and lakes and ponds uh, belongs to uh, budding riparian owners. It's, it's subject to a trust of, uh, for public navigation, uh, but the title actually does not belong in the state. And so this robust uh, title theory uh, does not apply to anything except uh, the land underneath uh, uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, in Wisconsin, by contrast, uh, the courts have identified the state constitution as the source of the public trust doctrine. In particular, there's a provision of the Wisconsin Constitution, which actually uh, dates or is patterned after a provision in the Northwest uh, uh, Territories uh, 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 Territorial uh, Ordinance. Uh, it says that the navigable waters leading into the Mississippi and St. Lawrence and the carrying places between the same shall be common highways and forever free, as well as to the inhabitants of the state as to citizens of the United States. So this constitutional provision, which is focused on navigable waters and provides that they're always going to be open, I guess, and, and free of charge to um, uh, the public, uh, is the foundation uh, of the Wisconsin uh, public trust doctrine. And it's been held to apply quite broadly to any navigable waters in the state, uh, any body of water big enough uh, to uh, have a kayak uh, uh, float on it, uh, plus uh, any uh, tributaries or uh, wells and so forth that might impair the navigability of those waters. Moreover, the Wisconsin courts have held that this uh, constitutional authority given to the Wisconsin legislature, uh, that the Wisconsin legislature uh, is the trustee of this uh, uh, Wisconsin constitutional provision, but that the Wisconsin legislature can delegate uh, that authority to the Department of Natural Resources and has done so. And so uh, you have these uh, interesting controversies about the extent to which the uh, delegated authority belongs to the DNR or not. Uh, interested readers, I would urge interested readers to take a look at the most recent Clean Wisconsin case from last summer. And the earlier uh, Lake Beulah case from 2011 is extremely interesting cases about the uh, permissible scope of delegation of the public trust doctrine to the DNR. Uh, so the recent uh, controversies have turned on whether or not the authority was validly delegated and what the scope of the delegation to the DNR happens to be. Um, when we uh, uh, consider the um, uh, Wisconsin law uh, further, uh, we see that um, uh, Wisconsin, like uh, Milwaukee, like Chicago, has had extensive landfill along the lakefront. This is a picture of, of Juno Park in 1922. You can sort of see the rail lines there and the landfilling associated uh, uh, with uh, uh, where the rail lines were located. Um, uh, and uh, so it's interesting to compare uh, controversies between Milwaukee and Chicago over whether uh, existing landfill that used to be underneath Lake Michigan can be used for uh, change purposes. Um, and the, there seems to be a different standard of review between the two states. Um, uh, in Illinois, uh, uh, there's no decided case by the Illinois Supreme Court that invalidates a transfer of previously submerged land to a private entity, but the tenor of the cases strongly suggests that this would be viewed with some uh, significant uh, scrutiny that if it was thought to be a transfer to a private purpose, that would be problematic. In Wisconsin, there's much less uh, legal authority about this sort of issue, uh, but the recent uh, controversy, uh, or I guess controversy over the proposed construction of something called the Couture Center, uh, which would be located uh, where the downtown transit center uh, uh, was uh, originally constructed, uh, suggests that there may be a much more uh, inviting or less uh, judicially intrusive attitude by the Wisconsin courts over such a uh, proposal in Wisconsin. The Couture Center is the one, the tall, this is an artist's rendering of the building, one on the left. Um, so uh, an advocacy group challenged uh, the proposal to build the Couture building on the lake on the lakefront in Milwaukee. 
a uh, group called Preserve Our Parks. Um, uh, but the district judge, the trial judge hearing the case in state court, uh, was not impressed. Uh, he pointed out that the state legislature had at an earlier point in time, 2014, relocated the boundary, uh, the official boundary of Lake Michigan, east of where the proposed uh, structure was going to be located. Uh, uh, Preserve Our Parks uh, presented evidence that this used to be submerged land under Lake Michigan, but the judge says, well, that was 100 years ago. Uh, there's no interference with public nav navigation, uh, and the legislature's action was rational and reasonable. Uh, no appeal was taken uh, from this decision. So you can see that uh, uh, in Wisconsin, you get a much more um, uh, intrusive uh, form of uh, scrutiny through the DNR of uh, inland lakes and waters, but arguably at least uh, less scrutiny of uh, proposals to build structures um, on previously filled land along the lakefront. Uh, let me just wrap up with a few uh, quick uh, concluding thoughts. Um, there are two big differences between Wisconsin and Illinois in terms of the public trust doctrine. Uh, the scope of the doctrine is much broader in Wisconsin. It includes all navigable waters in the state. In Illinois, it's a little bit unclear, but it seems to include only uh, the land that used to be submerged under Lake Michigan. At least that's where the doctrine has its most power. Uh, there's also a very big difference in terms of administrative enforcement. In Illinois, uh, the, we follow a litigation model. Uh, uh, people go to court directly challenging uh, decisions that are said to violate the public trust doctrine. In Wisconsin, most everything is channeled through the Department of Natural Resources, and you have an administrative process that unfolds uh, in order to re uh, resolve uh, public trust uh, issues. Um, I think the ultimate reason for this difference uh, goes back to the original rationale for the doctrine. Uh, in Illinois, it was this title theory that Justice Field came up with. Uh, and the title theory applies most clearly to the land under Lake Michigan. It doesn't clearly apply to anything else. And so the public trust doctrine is kind of stalled out, if you will, uh, along the lakefront under Lake Michigan. In Wisconsin, the original rationale was this constitutional provision, which clearly indicates all navigable waters are covered. Uh, which then leads much more naturally to uh, the need for um, uh, a broad delegation of authority to an administrative agency, and then you segue into a set of an administrative law process as opposed to a litigation model. Um, the changes with respect to uh, private development on filled land are hard to explain, but perhaps, again, because this land is said to have a, a, a trust impressed into its title, and courts uh, think of themselves as being in charge of construing title and enforcing trustee obligations and so forth, uh, that the Illinois courts would likely be more skeptical about changed uses of previously filled land. Uh, whereas in Wisconsin, uh, there isn't a lot of case law dealing with this issue and there's an administrative law process in place uh, which, where courts apply a degree of deference to agencies. Um, and so perhaps that conditions courts to be less intrusive about uh, those sorts of uh, projects. So legal legal path dependency is very important here. Uh, very similar geography, very similar uh, uh, environmental type issues over time between Milwaukee and Chicago, but the doctrine starts out on a different path and that path sort of leads us to different places uh, in the end of the day. So that's all. Uh, we have any questions we want to entertain, Joe? Thank you, Tom. I believe that I have successfully stopped sharing and the screen, uh, that is. And we do have two questions. Uh, the first is purely administrative and therefore must be for me, which is to say whether the slides will be made available. And the answer to that, regrettably, is no. We do not have the sort of permissions or clearances that would enable us to do that. We can present them in this way, but so many of them are, dare I say, in lakefront uh, and can be found there. The substantive question, Tom, uh, and either of us could address it, but I'm going to leave it to you, is whether there has been cleanup of the South Works site. Uh, so if you uh, want to spend a minute or two uh, bringing that story. Uh, further down to date than was possible, the Southwark site. 
Uh, yes, or, there's been or, or extent- maybe you call it by a different name now, eighty eighty uh, or whatever. Right. There's been extensive cleanup work on the Southworks site, uh, including uh, uh, environmental remediation. Uh, the uh, Illinois EPA actually uh, uh, signed off on uh, the clearance of the site as uh, eliminating any concerns about hazardous waste or toxic waste being buried at the site uh, some years ago. I think uh, I think the U.S. Steel Company paid something like $10 million of, uh, for remediation. Uh, uh, the U.S. Steel Company has also uh, conveyed uh, 100 acres of the site. The total site is somehow some almost 600 acres uh, for uh, use of a public park. Uh, so uh, you would think that there would be, um, uh, in the abstract, it should be a, in a very attractive site. It's got phenomenal views of downtown Chicago and the lake. Uh, the city, uh, the state of Illinois spent a huge amount of money, I think 60 or $70 million, building a segment of Lakeshore Drive adjacent to the site. It uh, doesn't connect up with Lakeshore Drive further north, nor does it connect up with the, um, the Skyway to the south. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot of effort to sort of make the site attractive to developers, and a number of developers have showed up with elaborate plans, but uh, for various reasons, they all seem to fall apart. Uh, and it's really a tragedy because the community uh, that surrounds this site uh, is uh, extremely badly deteriorated, as you might imagine. They had small houses that were occupied by steel workers who've been out of work now for some 30 or 40 years. Um, and uh, the whole area is uh, really badly uh, uh, deteriorated. It would, uh, a mixed use development would do wonders for this area, but. Uh, 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 it hasn't happened for a variety of reasons, including we speculate perhaps because of the uh, looming presence of the public trust doctrine here. Wonderful. So thank you, Tom. And I think that in order to ensure that we remain on schedule, I will hand it back to my colleague, Dave Striffling. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Kearney and Professor Merrill. We'll now take a short break to set up our next discussion and we will be back promptly at 1010. See you then, thank you. Welcome back everyone. We're ready for our second conversation, uh, moving forward now to focus on the present. Observers have long predicted a crisis of water infrastructure that will affect the health and safety of communities here in the Great Lakes region. In one recent estimate an investment of hundreds of billions of dollars would be required to repair and improve water and wastewater systems in our region. And climate change, of course, will only exacerbate the threat to these failing infrastructure systems with the worst of the threat often falling on our most vulnerable communities. This panel will discuss what we can do about these threats and whether the president's infrastructure package represents an effective path forward. During this conversation, I invite everyone in the audience to submit questions using the Q&A feature, and we will address as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the conversation. With me online today are Mayor Corey Mason of the city of Racine, Wisconsin, which is most definitely part of the Chicago megacity, Laura Rubin, director of the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, and Drew Williams-Clark, managing director for urban resilience at the Center for Neighborhood Technology in Chicago. Uh, so welcome to all of you and many thanks for joining us. The other member of this panel is United States Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who represents the 9th Congressional District of Illinois. Representative Schakowsky's schedule uh, changed due to a committee hearing uh, such that she was unable to be with us this morning, uh, but we're very grateful that we were able to tape record uh, her part of the conversation earlier this week. So we're gonna start uh, by playing that video. I'm very pleased to be here today with U.S. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, representing the 9th Congressional District of Illinois. Uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's really my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Now, I understand you have a longstanding interest in water. How did that develop? Well, you know, the late, great Senator Paul Simon, a good friend of mine from Senator from Illinois, um, sent me a letter. This was after he was uh, Senator. Um, and a book called Tapped Out. And in the letter, he says, um, the water issue is one that is going to explode on the earth 
before too long, but hardly anyone is paying attention. That was the year that I was elected to, to Congress. And he was suggesting that I needed to pay attention. Um, and we, um, I'm happy to say that we are paying more attention, but of course, there's so much we still need to do that we do need to do. Absolutely. And so we're here to talk generally today about water policy in the Chicago megacity and specifically about how some of the major legislation moving through Congress uh, might affect the infrastructure crisis. So you are a member of the House Budget Committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and the Environment uh, Subcommittee. So it's hard to imagine somebody better positioned to talk about uh, these issues with us uh, today. Sure, thank um, you. And it seems like we've been talking about some of these bills all summer long, the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill. Um, can you give us a reading on the current mood in Washington about whether uh, you can get consensus such that these bills can be passed? Well, first of all, I want to discourage people from listening too hard to the pundits who are going to say about the division in, among the Democrats and how hard it is going to be to pass the, the, this legislation. I absolutely believe there is largely consensus here and that very soon we are going to pass both pieces of legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the build back better reconciliation bill. Um, so, you know, stay tuned, watch for that, I think, before too long. But the, the, the bills, especially together, really make historic transformative changes in how we deal with water, especially drinking water. Um, and of course, uh, because we're sitting on the Great Lakes, we have a tremendous interest um, and uh, obligation to, to, to look at these issues. So the, uh, the, the bipartisan bill spends $10 billion, uh, billion dollars to address the um, dangerous issue of PFAS, the um, toxic chemicals, many different chemicals that um, are through our, our whole ecosystem, but also in, in, our, in our water. Um, and as uh, you know, exposure to PFAS can cause um, cancer, um, birth defects, very, very serious that we are addressing that in the bipartisan, bipartisan bill. The, the other issue that has really been so important to so many of my consumers and, and members of Congress is the issue of lead, um, the lead service lines in, in particular. Um, you know, we, we all understand that lead poisoning um, is especially harmful to children and has lifelong consequences because you can't, you can't cure it. Um, and, and so um, we um, have these, this huge number of lead service lines, that is the water coming to, into the house that um, can be tainted by, by lead. And I would say this is one of the premier issues that I hear about from my constituents, but also the municipalities, because some of these systems underneath the ground are so very old. What's the best way that the federal government can support our local communities in addressing some well, of those issues? You know, the uh, what, what we know is that in the bipartisan bill, there the, the president, first of all, um, promised that there he he would spend um, forty five billion dollars. He said that at a speech before Congress to deal with lead service lines to get lead out of the out of the water. The um, infrastructure bill makes a start. Um, $15 billion, but the Build Back Better bill takes us the, uh, the whole rest of the way with $30 billion. So money is very, very important. And, you know, you have in, uh, in the city of Chicago alone, just in the, in the city of Chicago alone, um, we know that there are um, 680 thousand no that's in illinois lead service lines and over four hundred thousand in chicago alone so this is a serious problem and that money will also be spent not only 
to make those uh, take those lines out and and replace them but also we have problems in schools and daycare centers that need to be investigated but i think um, none of our municipalities none of our communities can really do it alone and so this big commitment from the federal government the spending is going to be huge for us We've heard a lot uh, from critics of the bill as to the cost. Do your constituents worry about the cost or do they favor more spending on infrastructure issues like these? You know, absolutely. And I, I want to tell you something that both of these bills and the kind of neglect that we have seen in our infrastructure um, must be addressed. Um, and the longer you wait, the worse the problems get. And so um, people are very anxious to uh, address this. Um, you know, th this isn't one of these uh, issues that we can, oh, well, we can do it now, or we can do it later. The later is here. Um, and now it's time for us to act. And, you know, we, we are just getting so many um, letters and phone calls, especially when the issue of the lead service lines really, really came out. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that you're a member of the Environment and Climate Change Subcommittee of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Right. And, and obviously, the climate crisis is a major focus of the Build Back Better uh, bill. How is climate change likely to affect the Great Lakes region in particular? And what does the bill uh, do about it? Well, you know, first of all, we do have the Great Lakes Protection um, Act. Um, and by the way, we have a new person that's being announced uh, officially um, that um, Deborah Shore, who has been on our Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, that is going to be the Region 5 Director of the Environmental Protection Agency, someone who has dedicated her life to climate and policy that, uh, that relates to, to climate. So I feel like we're gonna get a great boost for, uh, for our, our region. Um, but you know, we, we know that, um, that the time is really up on, on climate. We're, we're at uh, gr ground zero here where, where we have to act. And the, and the Great Lakes are such a, a treasure. So much of the world's surface or water is, uh, is there in the, in, in the Great Lakes. So, you know, we have to do um, everything to, uh, to, to protect it. Um, and, and so that definitely is a concern and a, a, a focus of our environmental action in the, uh, in the Congress. And we have a lot of strong members along the, uh, the Great Lakes that are absolutely totally engaged in, in, its, in its protection. Um, you know, we, we wanna make sure that there's um, certainly no drilling that goes on in the Great Lakes. Um, we want to, to make sure that uh, none of the wildlife that's gonna ruin the lake gets in. Um, we're taking steps to, uh, to, to do that. Um, we, there's lakeshore erosion that we are spending money on to, um, to invest in. So that is a that is certainly a top uh, a top priority for us. Well, we will look forward to following the fate of these two bills over the next uh, few weeks and months. And thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Chikowski, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Well, I thank you, and I just want to assure you once again, particularly if people weigh in with our members of Congress, we're going to get this done. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you again to Representative Schakowsky. I want to return to the topic of the federal bills in a moment. Uh, but first, for all of our panelists who are with us at the moment, uh, I want to ask what you think are the greatest infrastructure needs uh, in the Great Lakes or facing the Great Lakes. Uh, what are the greatest threats uh, that we have right now? So Mayor Mason, maybe I could start with you, but uh, then move to the others as well. Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, although I think someone else may need to um, start my video. Um, but um, happy to to comment on um, what we think the the needs may be moving forward. Um, we we certainly have um, seen a lot of how climate change is already impacting infrastructure around the Great Lakes uh, substantially. Uh, we certainly had a lot of communities that had the big storm last January, uh, which you know has 
eroded hundreds of feet of, of waterfront and uh, and done tens of millions of dollars worth of damage. Um, and that's the the stuff that people can see, right? We have you know bike paths that have collapsed and beaches that are smaller. Um, but then it comes in other places where you wouldn't expect, right? I mean, so we have a, a wastewater utility system where on a day-to-day -day basis, we're nowhere near our capacity, but because these storms become more frequent and uh, more intense, uh, we're going to have to spend tens of millions of dollars upsizing our, our infrastructure just to deal with peak rain events, which are becoming, again, more frequent and more intense. That's extremely expensive. Um, you know, just in the last two years uh, as mayor, uh, between that storm and those peak rain events, we will have to spend between, you know, 35 and $55 million just to address uh, those issues. We're a city that spends about $80 million a year on an annual budget. So, um, you know, climate change has lots of impacts, um, but also among them are very expensive infrastructure costs that we're going to have to to rebuild to make sure that not only our lakeshore is more resilient, but our water and wastewater systems are resilient enough to deal with uh, the big challenges that are coming before us. That's why your conversation with the, the congressman that you played uh, is so important. We, we can't do this without the federal government being a major partner. Laura or Drew? Drew, you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> it's totally fine. Uh, and, and David, this question was on the water infrastructure crisis. Right. What do you think are the greatest threats that we're facing in the Great Lakes region? Yeah. So, so I'll take it back a little bit more to, to the region as a whole. Um, you know, we are really in a water infrastructure crisis. Um, we have underinvested in the maintenance of drinking and wastewater and stormwater systems. And you know all of the participants today have seen it. Uh, we have regular overflows of sewage. We have massive flooding events, regular boil water advisories, lead as was, has been talked about, and treatment that doesn't get rid of contaminants such as PFAS and lead. Um, and so we're grappling with old and unsafe drinking water infrastructure. Um, in the Great Lakes over 20 years, the EPA has estimated that that price tag is $188 billion to improve and upgrade and repair the drinking water and the wastewater and the stormwater systems. So, you know, this, this bipartisan infrastructure bill will go a long way. It won't get us to that 188 billion, but it, it's really needed. And we have, um, you know, numerous studies that show that need. Um, also, I wanna mention though, that the, the, this work is getting prohibitive in terms of costs and it's being passed on to our most vulnerable communities that can least afford it. Um, so when we invest in water infrastructure, it's really protecting public health, it's improving climate resiliency um, for our communities, it's reducing local maintenance and, and operating costs like the mayor has talked about, it's also creating good paying local jobs. Um, so it really gets to the health and well-being of our residents. Um, when we talk about federal funding, I think it's important to note that historically, our federal government um, really provided a lot more funding for water infrastructure. In 1977, 63% of the total spending on water infrastructure was picked up by the federal government. Um, in 2014, the federal government's contribution has dropped to just 9%. Um, so what does that mean? That's, that's the crumbling infrastructure. We see that underinvestment. Our pipes are too small. We're leading to overflows. Um, children are being poisoned by lead pipes. We have a lack of uh, skilled tradesmen in this area. Um, and uh, our, our drinking water systems aren't protecting public health. And so this is really why the infrastructure bill is so important to us and, and the reconciliation. Um, but it will help not only with the maintenance and the public health, but also bring down the cost of water that has been increasing for residents across the Great Lakes. Thank you, Drew. Yeah, no, I, I think both uh, Mayor Mason and, and uh, Laura made great points. I'll just add a couple of things that maybe weren't uh, hit on as intently, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think what we're talking about at this point, you know, first, I think it's important to remember that we're sitting on top of lands that were managed very, very well. Thank you very much by American Indians for thousands of years. Um, and so, so far, what we've primarily talked about is what we in the in the biz call gray infrastructure, right? And we kind of always think that we can build our way out of these problems by making pipes 
tanks and pumps. Um, and we sort of think that the mega solution centralized is going to save us. Um, but as, as both of the former speakers sort of hinted at, um, you know, we in our most of our older cities in the Great Lakes Basin, we have combined sewage uh, systems that were designed decades ago. Um, and they were designed based on modeling and data that didn't account for the rate of climate change that we see now. And there it's very inelastic, right? You can't very easily expand a pipe, a tank or a pump. It's very difficult to do. Um, but if we look at nature-based solutions, if we look at rain gardens, bioswales, um, if we look at stormwater parks, if we look at you know constructed wetlands, these are things that are much more elastic. They can accept overflow. They can treat to some degree overflow. They can go a long way towards these solutions. Um, I think the other challenge that we see is that there is a lot of barrier to looking at infrastructure as a harm reduction strategy, right? So Laura talked a lot about public health and how we sort of, we have a hard time conceiving of infrastructure as a public health system, even though it very much is. Um, I think, you know, the other side of that is, is thinking about it as, as, a, as, a, as a way to deal with the racial equity challenges that we've had for hundreds of years. So we just did a study in the city of Chicago and looked at where flood damage claims are happening and 85% of those um, during an eight year period happened in communities of color, 87%. Um, so this is, we're talking about, you know, in terms of threat, we're talking about water quality and quantity really becoming the next of the, uh, the converging crises that combine racial inequities with climate and economic impacts. These are going to be things that disrupt daily life and they're gonna be more disruptive to black and brown people. Thank you. Now that we've got some of the threats on the table, I wanna return momentarily at least to the subject of these federal bills. And Laura, I know you've been tracking them very closely in your role and I'm curious if you share Representative Schakowsky's optimism that they will be passed. And you've talked about this a little bit already, but what do you see as the most important features of those infrastructure bills? Um, I, I, I was very excited to hear her optimism and excitement about them um, as they keep getting delayed. Um, it, 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 it is a little disheartening, um, but uh, you know, again, as they keep calling the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, I'm hopeful that, that we will have um, passage of this. Um, they, they are really game changers together and, and even alone uh, the infrastructure bill, um, you know, just a, a couple sort of highlights there. Um, water infrastructure money comes to the states in, in most cases. Some of the assistance programs stay within the federal agency, but the states have a lot of leeway in terms of how they manage this money. Um, if these bills are passed, the, the infrastructure bill alone will triple the amount of money coming in. And, and actually in some of our Great Lakes states, it will quadruple the amount of money coming in to repair drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater systems. And as Drew said, there's a greater emphasis also on green infrastructure that we really like. Um, similarly, uh, the states are given a lot more leeway and direction about uh, providing technical assistance to some of the underserved communities. Those programs have been beefed up. Uh, there are more directives on providing more grants rather than loans, because this is something, again, the well-resourced utilities usually get these funds traditionally. And there's a lot of emphasis in this administration um, through the Justice 40 initiative and the emphasis on climate and equity on really helping these funds make sure that they're going to our rural populations, our uh, underserved populations, the disadvantaged community populations. So each of the states is able to develop their own plans. Um, I, I also think it's a game changer in that it really does focus on climate resiliency in many um, senses, and there's a lot of programs that really focus on that. Um, you know, I think some of the opportunities there are to reduce some of the silos that we have. Um, you know, the water assistance funds that have come through in the last year, uh, their administration versus the water infrastructure administration, it, it gets very complicated. And that's one of the problems with a lot of the communities making applications. Um, but you know, we see uh, you know we see a lot of opportunity here. And then similarly, the reconciliation package has a lot more focus on climate change action um, and some on the sort of human infrastructure. 
but also that's really where the money is for the lead service line replacement um, and for the combined sewer overflows and some of the farm bill conservation programs, you know, huge, um, that would be a huge shot in the arm for a lot of our large cities, Chicago, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Buffalo in dealing with replacing lead service lines. Uh, Mayor Mason, I want to come back to you for a moment. Uh, I might be paraphrasing a bit here, but you said something like, we can't do this without the federal government. And I'm curious if Rep, uh, Representative Schakowsky were here, what would you say to her in terms of what you most need from the federal government? Is it just a matter of funding or is there uh, something else that uh, you'd want the federal government involved with as well? No, I mean, it's funding and policy, right? I mean, I, I was really pleased to hear Drew bring up uh, racial equity as part of it. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's taking a really big step back, but if, if you look at um, racial inequities around infrastructure and climate change, it's easy to go to those lead laterals. Um, and, you know, for in the city of Racine, it's at least 40% of our houses that have lead laterals that need to be replaced. Those are the ones we know for sure. It may be as many as 60%. Um, so it's a real need. And, you know, you got lead going into to homes every day and it, it's not, it's not acceptable. But if you look at just how infrastructure um, it is not um, <clears throat> is not morally neutral, right? And so, if you look at a lot of um, the inequities that exist in in the Upper Midwest in the Chicago mega city region, and these inequities around housing and wealth and who gets to live in what neighborhood and who doesn't, so much of that is driven by water and wastewater utility decisions that were made decades ago. Um, so much so I had one local activist describe uh, our water boundaries as the new redlining uh, for the 21st century, because uh, we seem to have plenty to build out for the suburbs, but not enough to, to maintain the, the historical legacy cities that have their own infrastructure needs. And so, you know, those systems get built out at a huge discount to surrounding neighborhoods and, and jurisdictions and uh, the cities uh, that have these inequities um, you know, fall further and further behind. So it's it's a need for resources, but it's really a need for realigning our infrastructure discussions to look through the prism of both sustainability and equity uh, if we want to make real progress on these things. So I appreciate that. All of you now have uh, mentioned the environmental justice aspects of this, and I'm really glad we're zeroing in on that uh, as a topic. Um, Drew, maybe I could ask you to expand a little bit more um, we've, we've talked about how infrastructure issues are especially prominent in economically disadvantaged communities, communities of color. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the role of racism in causing these problems and how we can best address them? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, 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 I feel like I, I should talk about what I know best. So I'm going to talk mostly about flooding, but these are analogous to, to the lead service line problem. Um, and to the, the quality drinking water issue in general. But in, in terms of flooding, we know that there's a correlation between the geography of flooding and the geography of race, right? We've, we've done that at least for the city of Chicago. Um, the only thing barring us from doing similar analyses around the country is that insurance records are kept private and there are laws barring the ability to get independent analysis done easily without state approval of sharing those records. Um, so we've been sort of writing this one uh, release of those records in the state of Illinois since 2014. Um, but if there were a greater transparency around that, we could really look at this problem in a much bigger way. Um, we know that federal, state, and local policies caused black and brown people to concentrate in certain neighborhoods. Like that's full stop. We, we, we've acknowledged that at this point. Um, you know, we know that redlining proper through the uh, Federal Housing Administration. We know that investment inequities going back decades to when that was seen as politically acceptable have been unequal. Um, and we know that the course, at the very least, the corresponding impact on property values and the continued link between race and income have forced many black and brown folks, again, into underserved, infrastructurally underserved communities. 
Um, so we really, at this point, the, what we need to be doing is using policy and public in, investment to address these historic and now ongoing problems caused by these policies. So we need to be not shying away from saying we're going to spend more money in these places because we have prevented ourselves from spending money in these places for decades. We, we need to not shy away from that as the basis for making what some may call unequal uh, investment decisions. That's the reality of it. Um, so we, uh, and, I, and I believe Laura brought this up or, or maybe Mayor Mason did, I'm sorry, but we're, we're, we are cautiously optimistic about the Justice 40 initiative, which really came out of the, the president's office. Um, and the, the, the underpinning there and, and the sort of idea there that for everyone listening is that 40% of the benefits that are derived from public policy and investment should accrue to what are known as environmental justice communities. There's a lot to unpack there is the problem, right? So benefit, does that mean 40% of all investment? Um, benefit, does that mean whatever positive outcomes should go to these places? And what is an environmental justice community? Um, not to get too deep into the weeds here, but there's a there's analogs for this in the past that have not gone so well, right? So when President Obama introduced an affirmatively fur furthering fair housing measure, uh, they created a mapping tool, HUD did, HUD did, that said, here's all the data, These this is where the problems are. And most communities reacted and said, your data is not catching what we're seeing in our community. So there is an, an issue now with a federal EJ screen saying this is where the EJ communities are when they're not seeing what's going on on the ground. There is a, a historic and fundamental disconnect between federal policymaking and what happens in individual communities. And most of the environmental justice movement is about saying you need to do this with us, not for us. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's watching this to Google the Jemez principles that came out decades ago um, by the first People of Colors Congress in Jemez, New Mexico. Um, those really frame out what we need to be doing differently in terms of the way that we're way that we're making these decisions, and that they need to be collaborative decisions, not made by outsiders in a centralized place, but with people on the ground experiencing these harms. And that's really the pathway out of this. It just looks really different than the way that we've done things forever. And that's hard. It's hard to make those kinds of changes. So there's certainly plenty of reasons for pessimism when we look at our history of infrastructure and the amount of money that we need to make things right. Um, but I don't want our message to be entirely doom and gloom. Uh, any signs of progress that any of you can point to, things that we are doing well, improvements that we've made? I mean, I'll just mention as we're, you know, I do my annual budget address this coming Tuesday. And so we're putting our final touches on an annual budget. And I will tell you the world of difference that it is um, to be putting a budget together when cities get federal support from the American Rescue Plan Act is dramatically different than what we've had to do in my previous budgets, which have been about austerity and cutbacks and just struggling to maintain services uh, to keep our communities safe and healthy. Um, it has been a game changer um, under this administration and the relationship that we've already built uh, with the community. I, so I'm, I'm very optimistic about what that means. I'm actually thrilled that that money went out, not through HUD or FEMA or with a lot of red tape and actually, you know, came to the conclusion that maybe if we give money directly to cities with some goals of what they can achieve, um, they can do that faster and better than making everybody uh, run through a lot of red tape. Um, I'm very optimistic about that. And it's the, it's the best budget I've been able to put together in my, now this going into my fifth year as mayor. Um, and that's because of the investments that the, the federal government is making in cities and their commitment to giving uh, us real partnership status and being able to do that. So if that continues with, with these infrastructure bills that we're talking about, the, the bipartisan bill and the Build Back Better uh, legislation, um, that that is a game changer. I, I describe this as a generational opportunity to actually uh, reinvest in our infrastructure I think part of the reason you're hearing so much um, angst pent up is it's been a generation since we've really invested in infrastructure. Um, and so everybody's sort of, uh, you know, I, I feel a lot better having this conversation with the bills having passed than having them pending. Um, I was a legislator before I was mayor. I stopped being a legislator for a reason. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm always waiting to see the bills pass before 
uh, I count the dollars that that are going to flow from it. But I think the commitment that you're seeing from this administration around climate and around equity and already having invested in in cities in ways that we haven't seen from in decades, that gives me a lot of optimism. And, and I'm very excited about at least having conversations about how we might achieve these goals and not if we're going to achieve these goals or arguing with Washington about whether or not climate change exists. It's, it's really radically different than what we've seen previously. In, in terms of things that are hopeful for me, um, I would say, you know, our coalition is about 170 NGOs throughout the region. And we have a lot of our groups now engaged in reforming the state revolving loan fund. This is the process that the money comes from the federal government to the states. And a lot of our, our NGOs, uh, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, Milwaukee Water Commons, um, Ohio Environmental Council, et cetera, they're looking at the rules and regulations around how these funds go out. They're looking at the definition of disadvantaged communities. They're looking at the weighting and the scoring of how these things go out. That's really hopeful to me that we can change some of these rules and regulations and that really historically none of us have really looked very closely at how these funds have gone out and been distributed and there's a much, uh, you know, more close look at those things. Um, other things that are hopeful, um, you know, just where uh, communities are engaging uh, more with uh, underrepresented community, community-based organizations. Toledo, for instance, has established a Citizens Water Advisory Board um, comprised of citizens throughout Toledo, traditionally Black, Indigenous, and people of color to be more involved in the decision-making around water and water pricing. Um, and, and in Milwaukee, uh, there's been a big initiative around cleaning up some of the area of concern and that Citizens Advisory Council and redoing that Citizens Advisory Council to make sure that it's representative of the population in Milwaukee. So, you know, a couple of these initiatives make me really hopeful around water infrastructure. True, I know you're organization works a lot with communities on the ground. Any positive signs that you're seeing? Yeah, there. I mean, there are a couple. One, I think uh, we've got this uh, award-winning pilot where we work with local governments to uh, make sure that uh, flood mitigation solutions make their way directly to homeowners and building owners. Um, that I think is key uh, for years and, and in most cities today, the sort of outcome goals around infrastructure planning and engineering really are, are about system like replacing parts of a system on an ongoing sort of annual cycle or multi-year cycle depending on what the component is um, the goals aren't to reduce flooding in people's homes and i think once local governments start to see that as a goal then the investment start to change so we've seen that happen in a couple of places where we've worked ex actively with a few local governments who were ready to do cost sharing or just grants for rain gardens on in people's yards um, or for doing backflow prevention systems i mean over the last 10 years actually most uh suburban governments especially have already done backflow prevention system cost sharing programs um, which has made a huge difference for many folks that have had combined sewer backflow issues um, also, we're very interested in initiatives that combine building people's understanding about how the climate crisis impacts them and linking those to initiatives where they can advocate for themselves. And so we've been doing a pilot in the South Chicago Cook County suburbs um, where we are working with uh, residents who both sort of advise us on how project methodology takes place, meaning that we're working with them to design how a project happens. Um, but the sort of fundamental work is having people take photos of flooding incidents and upload them with sort of location and time specific data um, to a database that we ourselves then sort of maintain um, and make sure that people who can make those changes have access to that so that we're not just looking at where the model safe things could be happening. We're actually looking at where things are happening and making investment decisions in response to that. So I think those are two really encouraging things. I think we, uh, we wanna see more 
true partnerships between, as you know, sort of Laura describes, between the people who are making investment decisions around infrastructure with the people who are experiencing the challenges associated with a lack of investment. And the more that that can happen, the more I think that we'll see better and better changes. I also want to underscore what Laura sort of hinted at, which is that just because the federal st government starts raining money down doesn't mean that it can get where it needs to go. There are, it is notoriously difficult for low capacity, small, um, community governments to access federal money directly because of all the restrictions, all of the reporting, all of the, you know, nonsensical arcane things that need to be done to get the money where it really needs to go. And as long as we're going to have municipal governments serving people with with water infrastructure of 500 to 1500 people, we're going to need to make sure those governments have the funding that they need to do that well. And right now, it's very, very difficult for them to access those funds. This has been really interesting so far. And I have several other questions I'd like to ask, but I do want to make sure we respond to any questions that uh, the audience members have as well. So I want to bring on board Hillary Deploys, our Lubar Center program manager, who's moderating the Q&A, Hillary, uh, anything in the, in the Q&A box that we should respond to? Yes, thank you. There are two that I'd like to ask the panel. I'll take the first one. What are the key prov provisions of the pending legislation that will force significant reductions in carbon emissions, thereby protecting Great Lakes communities from the most severe climate consequences? And I'll open that to <laughs> whomever would like to tackle that one. Yeah, I don't have the, the numbers memorized, but certainly the, the conversations that, that we've been having with other cities uh, and mayors across the Midwest is uh, really an enthusiastic time, as exciting as the water infrastructure discussion has been around the laterals and, and other, I mean, when, when we're upsizing our wastewater uh, infrastructure, we're not reducing climate change, we're reacting to climate change, right? Um, but having a, a bill that's actually then proactively getting us to a place to figure out how to actually do our carbon emission reduction by 2030, which is not that far away, requires serious infrastructure. So everything in there from not only how can I have my city facilities be more energy efficient, but our homes and our businesses and, uh, and you know, it, everything from investing into electric charging stations to making homes and businesses more energy efficient to assistance with the, the fleet that uh, the businesses and governments use. Uh, there's really quite a bit in there to help us uh, get down that road. I don't know if it's enough to get us to 50% by 2030, but it is the biggest investment uh, in infrastructure to proactively reduce our carbon footprint uh, that I can remember seeing in my lifetime. So it's, it's a, again, I'd rather be doing the reduction of the carbon footprint than having to spend millions of dollars making pipes underground that nobody can see bigger um, because we have peak rain events. So it's we're gonna need to do both, unfortunately, because we've waited so long to address climate change, but the fact that we're finally working upstream metaphorically to get at the carbon issues gives me a lot of hope and makes me very excited about the future. Laura, I know you've been following those bills as well. Any follow-up on how the climate crisis is intertwined with the water infrastructure issues in the bills? Uh Corey, I mean, he encapsulated all of the pieces, especially at the, at the local government level. That's really important. You know, I think a, a lot of it is the incentives um, that Corey talked about for green energy and for some of the technology development on battery and alternative energy. Um, you know, also, this isn't the carbon reduction, but there's been a lot focused on climate resiliency, you know, as in the Great Lakes region, we've really struggled with high lake levels and a lot of flooding. Um, there has been a really unified voice coming out of the Great Lakes about the urgency and the need to invest in climate resiliency. And this gets back to Drew's original point about some of the green infrastructure, you know, some of that infrastructure that we already have or can rebuild in terms of wetlands and floodplains and forests that are also very important part of the discussion around climate. Hillary, I think you had another one lined up. I do. Up. Um, thank you. Are under are excuse me are underrepresented areas aware of the disparities in general, and would wider awareness lead to more equitable improvements? True. Sure, would you like, like to? <laughs> no, sure, sure. I, I I think it would be insulting to say they're not aware of it, but I think that they're. 
I think that many people, I mean, regardless of who they are, uh, and I think this is largely due to the sort of uh, Gen 1 conservation movement, making this a largely technical thing, right? Like, you know, if, if the more that we see these things as, you know, things to be measured by sensors or, you know, using, you know, very, very, uh, you know, technical instruments, uh, I think that we sort of separate ourselves, disadvantaged or otherwise, from this problem. I think what we're really excited about is looking at ways that people can, you know, document, understand the way that these problems are occurring right now and the way that they're already impacting them. I think that people tend to see these things, at, especially in flooding, people still conceive of this as sort of a largely random thing that happens unpredictably when it is neither of those things, you know what I mean? We we could be predicting these things. It, it isn't random at all. Um, but as long as people sort of are able to think that and sort of whatever they're dealing with to get to their job, you know, so like maybe going through sort of a swampy road and sort of a, being annoyed by, you know, water sort of flailing about as they, as they, you know, they roll over it with their cars. That's very easy to see as sort of random and something that, you know, people don't have control over or, or can't have a voice in. I think when people start actually going out and looking at how often this happens and how, how much it happens in the same places over and over again, they begin to like, they, they have a better understanding. I think they, are, they fully understand and intimately understand the disparities. I think it's, it's much more empowering when you can say, gosh, like this place in my neighborhood always floods. I've never noticed that. And then they have to start going down the rabbit hole of why is that? Was it the way the street was constructed? Was it the way, uh, you know, is it because it, it wasn't constructed, designed for that level of a storm? Um, is it because sort of there's an unwritten sort of policy commitment to streets being the place where water goes when it can't go anywhere else? All of these are things that happen, but until people are really engaged with them on a visceral level, I think it's it's very easy to see them as somewhat random and not something that they can have any control over. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. I'm not trying to disparage uh, technicians at all. We need technicians, we need sensors, but I just think that there needs to be a corollary where we're, we're really engaging with people um, more actively and, and more broadly, especially in, in black and brown communities that tend to be disinvested. These are the places that, that need more of that. Hillary, may I have time to squeeze one more in if you I got it? I hope so. Thank you, because, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this is a, an important one based on the conversation. Um, what barriers need to be removed in order for local communities and community-based organizations to be able to access the funding that's coming or potentially coming from the, from the federal government? I'll, I'll try to answer that uh, if I can. I mean, I, I will just say, I mean, I'm um, somebody who believes that that government is a, a force for good in people's lives and that it has a real responsibility to do things together that we can't do by ourselves. Everything from water utilities to fire departments and park systems and everything in between. Um, I will say though, as a small city, relatively speaking of, you know, just shy of 80,000 people and for, you know, NGOs and others, um, you know, FEMA and, uh, and HUD can be some of the most difficult red tape driven organizations that there are to deal with. Um, the amount of staff that we have in place just to do compliance with those two entities versus doing stuff on the ground to interact with our citizens and move some of these things forward is exhausting. It's why this ARPA funding has actually been so liberating because they've just said, here, here's some money. We know you've got a lot of things going on. You figure it out. You set the priorities. You figure out what the democratic process is. You figure out how to do that. I'm fully in favor of having standards that have to be met. I'm fully in favor of, of telling communities that there are goals that have to be achieved, that nobody gets a blank check to just do whatever without measuring the success of it. And indeed, if we're gonna address climate change, we have to measure how much carbon we're reducing to know if we're making any progress there. Um, but you know, a medium city like mine or an, an NGO, and you look at some, instead of it being like, here's programs that are available for people to use, it always feels like, well, here's a grant application that you have to do. And so good luck hiring somebody who will write it and then hopefully you compete for it. And, and maybe you have the resources to do that and maybe you don't. Um, I'm hoping the federal government as it's thinking about equity, both in terms of size and black and brown communities that need access to this, will be mindful of the infrastructure that they require 
communities and NGAs to put in place just to interact with the federal government and how exhausting uh, and, and seemingly counterproductive that can be. Um, and you know, there's, there's also policy decisions that have to be made. I mean, this sort of FEMA approach as we've been trying to rebuild the lakefront after the storm last year of, well, I know that thing just failed. We're only gonna pay to rebuild that thing that just failed. And that's all we'll talk to you about. And it's like, but don't I wanna rebuild something so it doesn't fail in the next storm? Nope, that's our policy. That's all we're gonna fund. Uh, and we're gonna make you run through hoops for the better part of a year and a half um, just to, to deny most of your requests. I mean, we have gotta get better uh, if we wanna make real progress on resiliency and climate change to making these funds that are available uh, and not sort of a, a, a scarcity game where, where communities and NGOs have to scrape together scarce, already scarce resources to beg for federal resources that uh, that just don't get out the door at smaller and, and uh, more localized levels. It's a bit of an editorialized, editorializing on it, but that's that's how it works on the ground. Thank you. And as terrific as this has been, I think we have to call time on this panel for now. Thank you, uh, Mayor Mason and Laura and Drew. And of course, uh, thanks to Representative Schakowsky as well. Uh, we'll now take our final break uh, and we will be back with our final group of panelists at 1110. So we'll see you back here then and we will start promptly again at 1110. Thank you. Thank you. We are back. Welcome everyone uh, to the discussion uh, associated with our third panel dealing with uh, the future. Recent reports have highlighted the increasing damage that climate change is expected to inflict on the Great Lakes region, especially in our coastal communities. But the Great Lakes is also viewed as one of the more resilient regions in the country and other experts predict that the climate crisis will actually cause mass migration toward us and the relatively cooler temperatures and abundant freshwater supply in the upper Midwest. So this panel is going to explore whether the mega city is ready for these changes. And leading the discussion will be our distinguished fellow in law and public policy, Mike Goucher. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Dave, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone watching today. Uh, our guests for this conversation are the Lieutenant Governor for the state of Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes. He chaired uh, Governor Evers' task force on climate change, issued a report late last year. Uh, also joining us today is Edith Macra. She is the Director of Environmental Initiatives for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, and she was co-lead author of the Climate Action Plan for the Chicago region. And joining us is Susan Echo, who is the Climate Adaptation Fellow for the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Thanks to all three of you for being with us today. And I was trying to think of a way to begin this conversation to build a foundation for the conversation. And I thought maybe this would be it. Um, uh, in a nation, a world that is uh, rapidly warming, is the Chicago megacity, this Great Lakes region, a uh, better position for that future? Or are we just dealing with a different set of challenges? And I'll begin with you, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. And I think you're still muted here. This is true. You think after almost two years, we've learned these things. But, <laughs> we're um, all learning. We're all learning. Believe me. We're all learning. Well, I just want to say, uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to participate in this conversation because I've spent so much time uh, addressing the many challenges of uh, the issue of climate change here in Wisconsin. As you mentioned, uh, the Chicago area and the Great Lakes region, we are blessed with our natural resources. And there is an opportunity for you know, some sort of, you know, some sort of gain for us in the region, but I don't want us to think about it in those terms, because if we do see a significant uh, population boom over the next couple of generations, this will still put a drain on the natural resources that we have. This will put a drain on our water. This will put a drain on our food systems. And as uh, the coast become even more threatened by climate change, I was you know, think about it, I was actually eating some almonds before uh, this panel started. And the idea uh, that almonds grown in California may no longer be, uh, you know, reality, may not be, uh, you know, be possible because of climate change uh, is something that we should all consider. And I don't want us to get into a place where we're thinking about, 
well, you know, everybody's going to have to come here. Everybody's going to have to spend their money in the region because that's not the way we should look at this. Uh, because as resources become fewer and fewer, uh, that is going to lead to some very significant challenges that the region just will not be able uh, to sustain because of the uh, because of the rate that climate change continues to happen because of the impact uh, that communities continue to feel. Edith Macra, do, do we have a, an inherent climate advantage in the Chicago megacity, or are we being a bit delusional if we think of it in, the, in that light? Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say thank you so much for, uh, for having me here, um, and it's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, distinguished uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, it's important to realize that, uh, that climate risk and vulnerability are very complex. And so while we have these inherent natural assets in, in a cooler climate, um, and abundant fresh water and the, uh, the very precious Great Lakes, we might have um, social equity challenges that could cancel out these benefits here. Um, and even across our region, you know, if you look in the Chicago, the Northeastern Illinois uh, portion of the Chicago megacity region, we can see um, large cities, there are five of them um, that uh, were rated urban adaptation um, assessment. And there's variation even amongst those cities. And the, the risk and vulnerability uh, to climate change has to do with a complex set of factors. Um, so where some cities like Elgin or Aurora may not be as well prepared, uh, Chicago would be better prepared. And that has to do with investments and, and social equity. And I think it's important to you know, realize that while our climate threats are not as dramatic as Western wildfires or um, uh, sea level rise, we do have some unpredictability, very serious unpredictability in the, in the threats facing our region um, with flooding and heat. And even despite our proximity uh, to Lake Michigan, we still face threats from drought. Um, in fact, Joliet, which is the third largest city in our region, uh, is facing water insecurity. So they've been using groundwater. They're predicted to run out of um, water supply by 2030 and are now shifting to, um, uh, trying to shift, make a quick shift to uh, Lake Michigan uh, water supply. So it's um, across the board, it is equitable planning, investments and policies that build our adaptive capacity. Um, the uh, climate advantage we have is not inherent in our relatively cool, uh, cooler temperatures our prairie landscape and our abundant fresh water. I think we need to uh, keep in mind the social vulnerabilities as well. Uh, Susan Echo, from, from your perspective, I mean, you're all about adaptation. That's what your organization does. How do you think this region is positioned for the, for the future here? Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I would agree with Edith and the lieutenant by saying that um, at ASAP, we try to look at these issues from an advantage and challenges perspective, meaning that while we have challenges, we also try to look at the uh, advantages that could present themselves. So for example, within the Great Lakes region, um, we have certain cities and communities that have low cost of living so that if people move, that would be an attraction. So with climate migration, it's good to look at it from a push-pull perspective. While within the Great Lakes region, there are definitely climate challenges that will cause people to need to adapt. At the same time, there are certain pull factors that will bring people who are experiencing more intense climate change impacts. So think about a pull factor such as, you know, for example, the access to fresh water, which in certain other parts of the country, they'll be experiencing serious water scarcity that would drive them to move towards the Great Lakes region. So also thinking about people living really hot climates to try to move to places that are cooler, um, that's an advantage whereby places in the Great Lakes region can attract people moving in. Um, another example is population decline in certain communities where we've seen over time that people have migrated to um, the Sun Belt areas. We could see those populations of people moving back when um, with climate change, it becomes really unbearable to live in such hot climates, people could move back. Um, also within from county to county, we've seen like movement towards urban areas in search of job, job opportunities where we've seen um, brain drain happening in certain communities. And so we could see that as an opportunity with good planning, it could be an advantage for the Great Lakes region. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, have you respond to that? Um, it, it, this is sort of the other side of this, this equation. Uh, 
the potential opportunity in a, in a state or a region that, that frankly has been in a slow growth mode for a while. Is there opportunity there or, or are we maybe being a little too um, hopeful uh, uh, about what would come next? There's certainly, you know, opportunity that comes along with growth. I guess one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for that level of rapid growth that could potentially occur? And, you know, Eva talked about the, the social aspect. Uh, think about former migrations in this country. Uh, you know, people weren't always welcome with open arms. You know, there are some very real social issues that we have to think about, some challenges that we have failed to meet as a society in terms of welcoming new people into regions of, uh, of this country. So uh, that's a very real concern, and it would inhibit growth if that, you know, descended into to, to chaos and, and catastrophe. And also, I think from a social lens, we need to think about the folks who aren't going to be able to move as well. You know, the people who won't have the means to be able uh, to get here. And then we have to look at current displacement, the people who are here now. And if there is that rapid growth, we see uh, cost of living continue to explode. We see, uh, you know, home prices, rent continue to go up and go up and go up. And if wages aren't keeping up, uh, people are going to be, people who live here now are going to be end up uh, are going to end up being displaced. And so, not only is there the drain on the natural resources, there's a there's a there's a societal. Uh, there's a societal depletion or lack of opportunity uh, that folks are going to have to deal with. And, you know, one other point, too, is, you know, Lake Michigan, incredible resource, but it is as susceptible to climate change as the uh, as the oceans. And I think that it's important for us to make sure that we are we're doing everything to prevent this. And, you know, some of this stuff is has become inevitable in many ways. But uh, I, I just think that we have to be very cautious about how we, uh, how, we, how, we, how we look at what a potential benefit could look like for the area. I, I want to explore that a little bit further, but, but I'd like to bring Edith back in. Uh, you were part of this, this uh, effort to, to map out a, a climate change plan for the Chicago region. And, and this is really about what we're doing now to deal with the future. I mean, we could talk about a population shift at some point, but we have to talk about the right now and, and the key steps in this. In, in your opinion, is this about us working together to reduce carbon emissions? What should we be doing right now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. And so the climate action plan that we just did for the Chicago region, it's only the third uh, regionally focused climate action plan in the US and we were mentored uh, by the European Union to do this. And what's unique about our approach was uh, as a council of governments representing 275 municipalities, most of us, uh, most of our communities do not have resources uh, to do climate action planning on their own. So this collaborative approach approaching, of approaching the region is what we, uh, what we took, do, took on. So the plan is uh, rooted in equity and it sets regional goals for both mitigation and adaptation. Um, and the actions are scaled for municipalities. And so According to what we found in the plan, um, it, there's the, the three parts of the plan, equity, adaptation, and mitigation cannot be separated. Uh, so we need to immediately stop um, emitting greenhouse gases and mitigate the ones that are already in there. Um, and there are some real gaps. It's, uh, you hear a lot about net zero goals. Uh, we set a net zero goal, but we cannot, um, through technology currently available, including the, uh, the modeling, show how we get there. Um, so the need to act immediately is, is apparent. Um, and adaptation, because we're already dealing with the impacts of climate change and we don't have time on that either. Um, and then equity, because we know the impacts are already being felt by vulnerable communities and will continue to worsen over time. So I can get more into detail about the, uh, the approach there. Um, but there is, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, absolutely um, critical that we start to reduce it, but they're all critical, all three parts of the plan. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, this does sound somewhat similar to, to your task force report, some of the same priorities, some of the same things that you felt need to be addressed right now. Well, yeah, we're removing the greenhouse gas emissions, of course, is, uh, is something that is a priority. Uh, reducing emissions and also uh, being able to mitigate what's already out there. And a lot of that 
uh, is another area where we're strong. We're talking about the Great Lakes now, but you know, think about the working lands that we have here in Wisconsin. You know, a chance for our you know our farmland to serve as sort of a a, a carbon sponge. You know, that's an opportunity for us as well. But if we see this big sudden boom in uh, population growth, there's going to have to be new development all over. And what is that going to do to our working lands? What is that going to do to natural space and our uh, natural ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere? We have to consider that as well. We have to consider, uh, again, those food security issues. Water scarcity is an issue, but also if we don't have enough land to produce food to uh, provide for the people who are going to be living here. We're going to be in a, in a world of trouble. So all of these things are in the task force report, food systems, subsistence, um, you know, and ag- there's a, a portion there for agriculture for these very reasons, because uh, our farming community has an incredible role to play in addressing climate change. There are many opportunities uh, for our, our, our rural communities to uh, be in the driver's seat here, and also an opportunity to increase production. There is also an opportunity for us uh, to think about other means of energy production, whether it's wind or solar on a, on this farmland. But if we have to continue to build out, um, the opportunities for that to actually happen are going to continue to decrease. Um, Susan, let me bring you back into to that because there, the, the lieutenant governor is raising some very practical concerns and considerations as we look at the future. How do we do some of these things given some of the challenges we already face? Uh, can you address that? He, uh, some of the concerns that he's expressed about, uh, about this migration and what it could potentially mean for our region? Yeah, I agree. Um, so while we think about climate mitigation, obviously climate mitigation cannot be separated from adaptation. We need to slow down climate change. And while we do that and thinking about the future, um, also considering um, clean energy technologies, but rethinking the way that we uh, develop these clean energy technologies for many of these communities in terms of um, incorporating not only the environmental dimensions, but also the social and economic dimensions. For example, with things like solar panels, creating opportunities for communities to own and control these technologies or even the development of these technologies. Um, at the same time, when we consider adaptation and people moving in, one other thing to consider is industries. So where would people work? So as we create these jobs that are around are reducing emissions, those are opportunities, economic opportunities, not only for the people who live in these places, but new people who will be moving in. So there are definitely ways that we can align climate mitigation and climate adaptation goals. When, when, uh, let me follow up on that, Susan. When, when we talk about climate migration and, and uh, uh, people moving to this region, who are we talking about? Who would move? Is it people who are younger? Is it people who have wealth and have the ability uh, to move, who, who are we talking about coming here? So with climate migration, there's still a lot that we need to know. And that's what I'll be emphasizing today, the need for increased research, the need for increased investments in trying to understand not only the fact that people will be moving, but who will be moving. So at ASAP, we have a program, um, a project which looks at predicting, developing methodologies for predicting climate immigration. And one of the aspects of that work involves demographic predictions. And what we're seeing so far is that younger people will be moving towards these areas. And so what does that mean? So we, we, we think about things like labor needs that could be met, different industries that could see people with skills moving in. But at the same time, um, this methodology developments that we've had have not been able to incorporate socioeconomic factors. So thinking about the socioeconomic status of these people are more wealthier people moving in or people of low income, because that could have different impacts on communities. So we also have another part of our work which um, involves coordinating focus group conversations with communities and we've had conversations with community-based organizations and environmental justice organizations. And one of the things they reiterate is the fact that 
um, for communities, especially those that have been disadvantaged over time, it will be important to understand who is moving in because those will have different implications. So for example, we have people of high income moving into these communities that has impacts or implications of gentrification happening. Um, when we have low income populations moving in, it means that we need to provide low income housing. So it's important for us to really continue to invest in this research, um, this research to be able to understand the different dynamics of movement. Uh, Lieutenant Barnes, um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, I, I, you know, uh, it is a, it's challenging because we have um, issues that demand action right now in terms of climate change. And yet we're talking about the future. And while we can predict it to some extent, we can't predict with any great certainty. There is the possibility of population growth, possibility of climate migration. Does this region need to be having those conversations now, or is it premature to be having this discussion? Of course, we should be having those conversations now. And I, I say that because how long has the discussion about global warming, how long has that been out there? And people have refused to come up with a plan or people have refused to act. And, you know, now all of a sudden you're, we're starting to get to a critical mass uh, about the issue where people understand, but there's still uh, so many others who are denying that this is actually happening. And I just want to make one point to follow up on, on what Susan was saying, you know, this is a society, let's, let's be honest here, this is a society that welcomes people of means. People that don't have those means are often disregarded. And that's uh, one of my biggest concerns here because these are the folks who are feeling the brunt of, uh, of climate change and are literally gonna have nowhere to go to the point that I was making earlier. Uh, but we should be having those, those, those conversations at least uh, in a theoretical sense, at least you know, considering, you know, how do we continue to manage uh, the the space that we have now? How do we how do we make sure that we aren't doing further harm? Because again, if we get rid of if, if if our working lands are depleted, if our water sources are depleted because it's population growth, that is just going to exacerbate climate change, and we're only uh, basically delaying the inevitable. If, if if you know we have all the people here, and it becomes uninhabitable uh, in a short amount of time. Just as quick as the growth can happen, uh, the destabilization can happen at the same rate if it's not done in a sustainable way. Edith, are, are, are these kinds of conversations happening uh, right now? We just don't know about them? Are, uh, what's happening from your perspective and, and the work that you do? Sure, um, and I'm glad to jump in on this, uh, this particular topic. One of the things I just wanted to point out is that I found um, in, when, in doing the climate plan is that climate action isn't very well understood um, by all levels of government. You know, what is climate action? And then in the same way, if we look at what's climate migration, are we planning for that good regional planning um, is planning for, you know, climate migration. So the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which was part of our, um, our uh, climate action plan, has a, a long-term regional plan um, onto 2050, which has a principle of inclusive growth. And we look very critically at the way we use land and the way we build out transportation systems. And if we take this pause um, that we've been through, through uh, the pandemic, through economic um, downturn and, and changes in the housing market, um, the shift in transportation uh, uh, demands that we're seeing now again because of the, um, the, sh the changes in the pandemic, and if we use that to use the phrase that's you know out there now, build back better. Um, this is a real opportunity for us to learn. I mean, the climate action plan really points out some of the weaknesses in the way we've designed our cities and designed our societies and designed our communities and how we respond to threats. Um, and we have that opportunity now. I think looking forward um, to what you said, Michael, about is this an opportunity? And then just to respond to uh, what Susan and the lieutenant governor said is. Who else will be moving into the area? I think industry and water dependent industry, we think about climate migration. So where will those jobs come from? Will there be new opportunities that are related to industries that see an opportunity here? So I think this critical thinking um, about regional planning is underway. Um, and then simply putting uh, that in a climate context is something that we're very much moving towards. And I think it's a real opportunity. And it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to have this, uh, this conversation about the, uh, the megacity in the region. 
Let, let me ask uh, this question, and, and I'll, I'll get back to Susan in just a moment, but of, of the Lieutenant Governor and of you, Edith, um, do we have the capacity, uh, this gets touchy because we're, we're talking about state lines, do we have the capacity to think collaboratively, co collaboratively as a region, or are we held back by the fact that we have state lines separating us? We have some counties in in northwestern Indiana, we have counties that surround the Chicago area. We have counties in southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, yes, we all face the same challenges, but can we all get on the same page to enact plans that make sense for the future? And I'll begin with Edith, and then I'll go over to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, and that's a really good point. So, you know, the optimist in me wants to say yes, you know, but there are um, certainly policy differences when you think across the mega region. But I think the saving grace here is that not all, um, all of our climate action and all of our collaboration necessarily comes from the same entities that are bound by those, those political jurisdictions. Uh, so even in our local government, when we did the climate action plan, our communities are very responsive to their constituents. And um, the constituents don't always think in the same political boundaries. So public opinion really is demanding climate action. We look at the private sector, you know, the um, uh, academic institutions are really pioneers and leaders on climate action as our industry. Um, and then I think regions, this, this uh, pioneering approach to do this regional climate plan is something that we were invited to do by the European Union because it's been so successful in Europe. Um, there were three other regions that participated with us. So I think this kind of um, regional collaboration always been a part of what we do and certainly in terms of economic development, but I think it's opportunities for that continued and strengthening of this regional um, cross uh, multi-jurisdictional approach is, is, uh, is imminent. L Lieutenant Governor Barnes, you know better than I uh, that you know these uh, our various states have sometimes been at odds with each other, uh, states trying to steal companies from one another, states uh, seeing themselves as economic competitors rather than as uh, uh, entities that might cooperate for the better good of all. Uh, can we make this work? Uh, you know, because it's really a regional issue. It's not just a state issue. It's a regional issue. Yeah, so I, I do think it's possible. And there are still some very real political and economic uh, speed bumps, so to say. Uh, however, states like Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and we just came up with that partnership, the, the REV Midwest Coalition, the Regional uh, Electric Vehicle Partnership. So that's an example that it can work. Uh, however, you know, a buddy of mine reached out from Iowa. He said, well, why are we a part of this? And uh, I, what was, how it was explained to me is that Iowa, like they decided to be an observer in the process because of, uh, you know, because of biofuel considerations. And so there are certain things that, you know, some states are just gonna be a little bit uh, more hesitant to, uh, to, to participate in, but the example, an example uh, is set that it, it, it can happen, uh, but, you know, that we, none of us should fool ourselves into thinking it's gonna be uh, some easy endeavor. Susan, what, what kinds of conversations are you having right as we speak? Uh, are you talking with municipal leaders and, and what are they telling you in those conversations? Yeah, we are. Um, we currently had a focus group conversation with state government representatives and touching back on what my panelists just said, um, you know, they keep reiterating the fact that there needs to be cross collaboration across various agencies at the same time, across different levels of government. Um, these create opportunities for knowledge sharing, for mobilizing resources. Um, sometimes the resources to undergo this planning at the federal level. At the same time, there is that bottom up knowledge that comes from the local level that can be brought into conversation. So really there's that need for cross collaboration across different skills and different levels of government. With climate migration, we know that this happens across state lines, across borders. So I feel like it's important that, you know, we consider these different aspects of the conversation. Um, I'd like to get each of you to, to, to sort of weigh on, on weigh in on, on the immediate future. So we're having two conversations kind of simultaneously. One is about what we need to be doing at this moment to address climate change, to, to do as much as we can to mitigate uh, what we know may be our future. 
uh, heavier rainfalls, more flooding, uh, warmer temperatures, more drought. So we're trying to address that, but we're also trying to think forward to what may be a trend that is 10, 15, 20 years away. So as we look at the next five years, we use that as our time frame. As we look at the next five years, what should be the primary focus of the discussions we're having right now? Um, we've touched on this to some degree, but I'd like to get, you know, if, if you were setting priorities, what would those priorities be in the next five years? Edith, I'll begin with you. Um, sure. And, you know, the Priorities Act now, um, a five-year timeline, uh, 2030, which is a tipping point, is going to be here before we know it. And um, and as I think the Lieutenant Governor will all agree, you know, and, and as you've hinted, that we move slowly um, and we've moved too slowly. So uh, as far as the climate action plan, um, it, the most important thing is greenhouse gas emissions. And it, the biggest source of emissions is in the power sector. So it's not just, we just had uh, an incredibly powerful legislation passed in Illinois, which sets very ambitious targets for cleaning up our power sector. But um, we all have a role in then supporting clean energy and for local governments, that is accelerating investments in their communities in clean energy. And we can do that through policy steps, things like um, uh, building standards and uh, energy efficiency, uh, strong energy efficiency codes, um, and then also in driving demand for clean energy. So procurement pools, helping municipalities, or excuse me, helping uh, constituents access community solar. These are all high priority items that are highly impactful. Um, the next biggest one on the mitigation side is related to transportation and getting out of cars or reducing vehicle miles traveled. So we really need to um, provide the infrastructure and the support to get people using transit and active transportation. So those are the highest priorities with the biggest impact. On the adaptation side, um, it's uh, addressing anything from uh, related to flooding is the very high priority. And there are the priority actions there are anchor that in all of our um, actions in equity and inclusion um, so that people who are most impacted are included in planning and processes. Um, and then to uh, coordinate across government agencies and across jurisdictions is really the most important thing that we can be doing so that investments and actions um, can be aligned with the future, uh, future climate changes. Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, five years, uh, what, what are your key priorities in that, that time window? Yeah, um, the clean economy is the biggest piece. Uh, you know, that's how we make sure we get, you know, even those who may be resistant to talk about the issue of climate change, the economic piece is something that uh, they still, you know, they people won't debate where regardless of how uh, anti-science some may still be. And that clean economy for, piece means you know, investing in renewable energy, but it also means manufacturing right here at home. Uh, it means just not having to rely on, uh, on on components, on pieces, or even the manufacturing itself to happen overseas and have it shipped over here, which is also uh, driving up emissions. And uh, agriculture is a big piece as well, our food systems. And uh, we also have to, you know, resilient, we have to build more resilient systems in communities as well. And that includes uh, neighborhood planning, making sure that we're, we're as, as, as areas begin to grow and we begin to see a boom, uh, making sure that, you know, driving does not have to be the only option for these communities. Uh, safe walkable routes, you know, biking paths, you know, there's opportunities for, for leisure that does not uh, contribute to more emissions. And I mean, that can be woven into the whole transportation piece, but I'll just keep that one separate just to make sure I hit, hit, all, hit five different <laughs> topics. Uh, but the electrification of a uh, transportation sector. And then forestry is another one as well, making sure that we are not losing uh, you know, more, more land and opportunities to, carbon ca or to capture carbon uh, at, the rate that, you know, at the rate that we have seen it happen. Uh, across the globe, you know, deforestation has been a, a huge problem, and it can happen uh, right here at home if we're clearing the way for uh, less sustainable uh, development. And we're going to have a challenge. Do you th do you think uh, one quick follow up on that, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes? Are the people ahead of the politicians on this? Maybe not all politicians, but are are the people ahead of the politicians? The people who are ahead are ahead of most politicians. I'll say it that way, um, because there's still a bunch of folks that 
you know, who are impacted by, by climate change. But if you got other concerns, you know, you look at the people, like I said, who are the most impacted by climate change. These are typically communities where folks are, are, are still kind of struggling. And if you're still figuring out, you know, how to make ends meet, how to put food on the table, this may not be the first thing you're thinking about. Uh, but for those who are deeply uh, concerned and, and, and passionate, who have studied uh, this issue extensively and who are currently doing the work, I would say, uh, are way ahead of, of many politicians, especially, uh, you know, in the, in the activist space. And the politicians who are behind, uh, I don't even think they're trying to catch up, to be honest with you. That's the real problem. Susan, I'll, I'll give you a chance at this. Uh, in five years, uh, what would be your key priorities in terms of addressing both the, the potential for further climate change damage, but also the possibility of climate migration? I think for many vulnerable communities, the need to build resilience and especially thinking about how the most vulnerable will be impacted and incorporating that into planning, ensuring that those groups of people are protected. Also, I would say in terms of data, um, there needs to be data and models that account for these economic disparities and social inequities that may influence different migration trajectories and also impact receiving communities, receiving cities. Also thinking about other general socioeconomic and political factors that could influence um, the way people are impacted by climate change, but also climate migration patterns. Um, there's need to enable receiving communities um, to equip them with as much information as they need to help them prepare um, for climate change. And that includes engagements with people who are the ones that will be the most impacted. So we need the active representation and diverse voices in really planning for climate change and planning for climate migration. Um, so really engagement with communities, both from sending cities to receiving regions. So um, having that connection between those different parts so that planning is not done in a piecemeal fa fashion. Um, also considering the housing infrastructure, jobs and amenities um, and planning for those changes that will impact these different um, critical areas that people need, both for people who currently live in places that will be impacted by climate change, but also um, the needs that would increase with people moving in. So these are the areas that I would say are key. That's great. What I'd like to do now is uh, bring back uh, Hillary DuBlois, who is our program manager here at the Lubar Center at Marquette Law School, to see if we have any questions. And if so, Hillary, uh, feel free to ask away. Well, thank you. Um, this question I'll ask to the panel, and and I'll you know feel free to jump in. Um, is the migration is migration more likely to further emphasize the racial inequity? excuse me, racial equitable disparities in the larger cities, or is this an opportunity to improve on these issues? Um, Lieutenant Governor, would you like to tackle that first? And then Edith or Susan, please weigh in. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, while you were talking, I actually clicked the question and I thought I was reading along to the same one, but I was not. So can you, for, can you forgive me uh, and, and can we just run that one back? I was reading the wrong question, sorry. Oh, no, not at all, of course, uh, technology. Um, now I lost the question too, now we're in trouble. Um, is migration more likely to further emphasize the racial equitable disparities in uh, larger cities or is this, could this be an opportunity to improve these issues? The answer is who knows, it could, but I think that we have to be conscious of it. And as, uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, are these conversations happening? They aren't happening at the level that they should that, that I know of. And when they do happen, we have to talk about inclusivity. We have to talk about equity. And I think about the great migration that, you know, brought my grandfather here from Louisiana and, uh, and, and so many other folks. And as I mentioned earlier, people weren't always uh, welcome with open arms, and that's something we have to have to have to in, intentionally or deliberately uh, in, involved in the conversation, or else uh, there won't be equitable access. Uh, it will further emphasize uh, disparities that can that currently exist. And 
it's like the thing is, we, we've seen this sort of thing happen before. The example is already in front of us. Uh, the history is our greatest informer here. So we need to uh, think about the historical trends. We need to think about the historical precedent uh, when we are having those talks. And, you know, if it doesn't end up happening, if this big wave of migration doesn't end up happening, fine, it doesn't matter. It's not like these conversations would have been had in jest because we still have current issues that we need to address. And how we talk about uh, a, a, a possible uh, wave of migration, like the solutions uh, to that will that will buffer, you know, further inequity, uh, can be the solutions to solve the current problems we already have. I'll just answer that quickly with yes and yes. You know, yes, is it possible that it could um, that a new migration could exacerbate racial inequity? Um, certainly. And is it an opportunity to um, right some of those wrongs and do this better? Yes. Similarly, I'd say yes as well. Um, I think that racism is a big thing with social cultural changes that might happen in different uh, receiving communities. There's the need to understand and plan for those things and see how to avoid the effects of those things on vulnerable people. Thank you all. To further along that um, train of thought, as the uh, Climate Action Plan was developed, as the task force, Gov uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes was doing their work, um, were environmental justice organizations involved in crafting those engagement plans and cra crafting those plans? Uh, yes, they were. If, uh, the, if, if you haven't had a chance to check out the report, it's just at climatechange.wi.gov. Uh, if you, it, right in the very beginning, it lists all the organizations that were a part of, uh, the, of the conversation. So the answer is uh, yes. We brought together traditional environmental advocacy groups. We had organizations like Milwaukee Water Commons, and we had organizations uh, like labor unions represented as well in this conversation as we have, uh, as we have discussions about what a just transition uh, will look like. Um, and our climate action plan had um, 170 organizations um, that were involved in it. We were a tad challenged um, because we started the planning process just before the pandemic and we did we completed our, our plan during the pandemic. So um, we uh, did really well with engagement, but you know, could there have been more voices at the table? Absolutely. We did have 53 local governments and we worked really hard um, as our primary constituency is uh, local governments. We worked really hard um, to make sure that environmental justice community leaders were involved in our conversations as well. Thank you. To keep us on time, Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, I'm just going to make this very brief and say uh, thank you. Thank you very much to our guests today, Edith Macra, uh, to Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, and to Susan Aiko. Uh, we really enjoyed the conversation. I uh, hope you did too, and hope everybody watching enjoyed it. Uh, having said that, I will turn it back over to Professor Dave Strifling. David? Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you to that third group of panelists for a really excellent discussion. I appreciate it very much. And in wrapping up today, I want to thank all of our participants, our technical staff who worked very hard behind the scenes to allow us to pull off this large scale virtual conference. And of course, I especially wanna thank all of you in the audience who spent some of your very valuable time with us. Without interest from you, we wouldn't be able to do programs like this. So thank you again, and I hope to see you in the future at more of our Marquette Law School programs. Thanks.